Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, both uh, Shubham and Ayush. One more time. You can hear me, right, Ayush? Yes, sir, yes. Okay, cool. So uh, we'll proceed. And today, uh, so the goal is before the mid semester, we'll finish everything related to piezoelectrics and ultrasound. And then, you know, um, after the mid semester, we'll um, start with a new thing. So the whole course, I have broken it up into three segments. The first segment will be, uh, which we have, which we'll be completing today, is related to piezoelectrics and ultrasound. Both are related, right? It's, it's uh, ultrasound is just an application of the piezoelectric. After the mid semester, we will um, talk about feedback principles and uh, the implementation of feedback principles on pneumatic and uh, inflow meters, uh, pneumatic controllers, uh, hydraulic controllers. And then the third part will be comprising on optical, um, you know, uh, sensor systems. Um, and there I will try to cover, um, you know, uh, we don't have much time after the mid semester. We have only 14 lecture hours. After that, uh, in the optical portion, I will try to cover, um, you know, um, uh, some good amount of electronic circuits. Um, and also, we will discuss noise in electronic circuits. Noise is one thing that, you know, um, even, um, you know, um, pretty good experienced engineers may not have a very good handle. So, uh, so I have my own noise course that I used to take uh, to uh, when I was like in the industry, I would be, you know, taking some lectures uh, on uh, noise. So probably that I will uh, try to cover as much as possible towards the last part uh, along with optical devices. So that is the general um, kind of overview of the full course, but let's proceed for now. Okay. Good morning, Anish. So, yeah, so last um, uh, class we saw that you know in the ultrasound system we need to take care of timing right because uh, when we are sending the waves uh, the waves will be reflected back and based on the time difference between the transmitted and the reflected wave um, we can calculate the distance between um, let's say the transmitter i mean which is essentially where the user will be and the media uh, and how far the medium is right and uh, uh, based on the these waveforms uh, uh, last class we discussed what are the key critical care abouts we need to take uh, when we are transmitting so first the window width should be high enough uh, i mean should be large enough so that um, you know there is sufficient energy in each pulse and um, tt which is essentially the you know uh, time between so so the first transmitted wave and the second transmitted wave right so this should be much much greater than tw uh, to, uh, which will ensure that there will be no interference between the first wave and the second wave and the reflected tr so tr sorry this is actually um, uh, tt is actually the reflected pulse uh, so TR is actually the time between the first pulse and the second, uh, the consecutive pulse. So we need to ensure that the second pulse is far enough from the first so that all reflections are attenuated before the next outgoing pulse. This is kind of simple to understand. If you just uh, have a look at this, uh, you know, a slide, you should be able to gather why these key constraints are taken, uh, taken, taken into picture. Now let's look into the, you know, an ultrasound pulse ecosystem, which um, the doctors, if you look at the, uh, you know, if you go to a clinic, um, you will see, you must have seen an ultrasonic uh, system, right? And how that works, right? So if we see here, we have a piezoelectric crystal, which can work as a transmitter and a receiver, both. And then we talked about the matching layer, why the matching layer is important, right? And what should be uh, the characteristics, the acoustic impedance of the matching layer um, in correspondence to, I mean, corresponding to, um, you know, the characteristics of uh, the transmitter and the next medium itself. We derived a relation between that, right? So we have the matching layer, and typically this can be a PVDF kind of a material, or it can be some gel uh, that can be put. And then we have the skin, epidermis, dermis, fat, and bone, right? This is what, let's say, of the cross section of. Uh, uh, the body will be. 
So what happens is if we denote um, you know, the x-axis, y-axis and z-axis, as I have shown, the x-axis is along the skin in this direction, y-axis is also in the same plane, and z-axis is the one which is going inside the body, right? So if we have to do, a, and why do we, uh, I mean, this is kind of used for medical imaging, right? We want to uh, find the profile of, of uh, the body using sound waves and measuring the pulses, we, if we can uh, create a picture. So this is, let's say, the real picture. We have to come up with a mechanism which will create a replica of this picture, right, um, using uh, the ultrasonic principles. So, um, so here, please note one important thing here. Um, in again, you cannot see um, you will probably not see these kind of pulses that have been drawn. Um, uh, while this has been discussed in Bentley, John P. Bentley, and this is one book which um, I have referred John, I think John P. Bentley. Uh, so this is one book which I have referred um, uh, quite a bit while preparing the material, but then I've probably taken only 30-40% of the material from uh, John P. Bentley overall, in the overall lecture, uh, this thing, or probably even lesser. But you can have a look at John P. Bentley and what it has got to say. Uh, so if you look at these books, right, you will not see the shape of the pulses like this. And I will tell you a reason why I have drawn it differently than what uh, Bentley shows. Let me discuss that. So let's say on y-axis here, we are um, plotting the voltage, um, I mean, the pulse height. Uh, uh, y-axis is voltage and the pulse height, we are plotting that on the y-axis. And on, on here, on the x-axis, we are plotting time, right? And this time, please note, I have written this equivalent to z, which means equivalent to z in this direction. Why? Because if I am going to transmit a pulse, which is going to enter the body, the pulse will be in the direction in the z-axis direction, not on y or x, right? Because I'm transmitting the sound wave, which will flow, which will go into the body, right? That's the reason I've, um, you know, so this time corresponding to the z-axis here, I'm plotting on this x-axis uh, of this curve, right? Of this graph. So if you see, the first one is the outgoing pulse. So this is a pulse that I have transmitted, right? So this is a transmitted pulse. And these three, of different shapes, I mean different heights, are reflected pulses. So in Bentley, you will see the pulses are drawn as decaying. I mean, the first pulse may be pretty large, the reflected pulse. The second pulse will be small, and the third pulse will be smaller. So Bentley draws the pulse height like this. Third pulse will be drawn like this. That's how Bentley shows that this is how the pulses would look like. But what I am showing is that the pulses will not look like this. It will have a, um, you know, uh, and conceptually it's important to understand why uh, I'm showing it like this. Um, uh, so Bentley approaches uh, with a thought process that look as the reflected pulses come back to the to the receiver because it has been reflected from, let's say, a surface or a, 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 a so so the, the so these are the surfaces, right? of concern to us. So one, two, so this is, so let's say the skin is surface one or, or medium one and um, the dermis is medium two. So we have an intermediate, um, you know, surface between one and two, right? And similarly between two and three and between three and four. So all the, the acoustic impedances of these medium will be all different from each other. And hence a portion when the sound wave propagates, a portion of that will be reflected and a portion of that will be transmitted, right? Here, we are in interested in the reflected component of the wave because we have the receiver also sitting on the same side of the skin. Had we, if we had the receiver, let's say on the other side, then we would be probably talking about a pulse which actually gets transmitted from one medium to another, right? It will go from medium one to medium two to three to four, and then let's say if we had a, a receiver here, then we will be talking of the transmission coefficient, not the reflection coefficient, right? So what Bentley suggests is as if because these surfaces, uh, these boundaries, 
uh, of the two medium, uh, they are uh, like little bit farther from each other. So the reflected coefficient uh, will be such that, or the reflected pulse will be such that. So for example, this first pulse, where is it coming from? So this is because of the interface between medium one and medium two. So that's the reason I have shown it as it is the time period. So this is the time, this is the time between the two pulses and it depends on the transmission coefficient of the interface between medium one and medium two, right? So what Bentley suggests that because the reflected pulses are going to come one after the other, the last reflected pulse probably will come because of this interface between the fat and the bone. And this is farther from the farther from the epidermis and the dermis interface. So the reflected pulse will be smaller in magnitude. However, what it doesn't consider is the reflection coefficients of each of these interfaces will be different. So the amount of, so for example, the reflection coefficient between the skin and the dermis, right? Meaning what is uh, just below the skin. So these two media are, they actually have very similar acoustic impedance. And because of that, most of the sound wave is going to get transmitted from the skin to the dermis. It is not going to get reflected as much because the acoustic impedance is similar. However, for the last interface between fat and bone, which we can clearly understand that fat is like a soft tissue kind of a, um, you know, structure or a medium, whereas bone we know is a hard material, right? So the acoustic impedance, difference between the acoustic impedance between the fat and the bone will be significantly more. And because of which, most of the sound waves being transmitted from the fat to the bone will be reflected back instead of being transmitted back. So the, ref so the energy content contained in the reflected wave from this interface, interface between three and four, they may actually end up getting or having a higher energy than the first two pulses. Am I clear why it is happening? Bentley assumes that because this is farther down in time, the, uh, so the reflected pulse will have smaller and smaller magnitude. But here what I'm just showing that it, yes, there is a time component to it, that if the, if the interface is farther out, then the intensity of the sound wave receiving the interface, uh, I mean, reaching the interface itself will be smaller. That we had discussed, right? E to the power that alpha, um, L, if you remember, right, there is a e to the power minus alpha LM. We had discussed that, right? Why with distance, the intensity reduces, right? So there is this component, which is there, but then also, we also have to take into consideration the reflection coefficient. And that is the reason the pulse, the reflected pulses may not have a decaying kind of a structure, right? So this is important to understand. So any questions up to this point? So please note, please note that this is time. And the first reflected pulse is going to come because of the interface between medium one and medium two. And it is lying very, it is very close to the transmitter itself. So obviously the reflection from the first interface, interfacing uh, me, uh, surface between these two medium, this will be the first pulse. Second pulse will come from this interface, two to three, right? And then the last, pulse will come from, the reflected pulse will come from interface three and four, right? Okay, so if that is the thing, T12, we can say T12 corresponds to the thickness of the epidermis. T23 corresponds to the thickness of the dermis. Please understand thickness means the distance that the sound wave has traversed, right? And T34, is equivalent to the thickness of the fat, this layer at this point here, right? And this typically is known as something called A scan. So the ultrasound uh, system can 
uh, you know, there can be different scan modes. If you look at the scope uh, that the doctor uses, he can, um, you know, use the scope in different scan mode. So this is the A scan mode of an ultrasound, wherein what we are doing is a very simplistic uh, uh, measurement. We are transmitting the wave and on the x-axis, we just plot the waves as the reflected waves as it comes. And we see that there is one reflected wave here, the other here and the other here, right? So from this, if we say that this is a scan, we what information do we derive? We derive that there are these three different interfaces. After the skin, there is this dermis. So we know without having to cut the body of the patient, we know that these are the interfaces between the different medium, right? And that is where ultrasound becomes so important, right? It's a non-invasive um, way of analyzing the body. So this is a scan, right? Okay. So corresponding to a scan, so a scans typically are used for uh, in ophthalmology in um, you know eyes um, to to check uh, the condition of the eye. And here, if you see, right, if we have, let's say, the ultrasound uh, being given uh, to the patient, uh, to the eye of the patient here at the, um, you know, outside, then, you know, we will see the reflected um, uh, waves. Uh, uh, so these are the reflected waves from the eye. So here, for example, if you see here, the last reflected wave essentially has the biggest amplitude because you know, whatever this is called, uh, I forget whatever this is called. So this is where the um, eye boundary ends, right? So maximum amount of energy will be reflected. Sound energy will be reflected from this interface. And there will be some small pulses here. So based on the time gap between these two reflected waves, we can calculate what is the thickness of the lens of the eye, right? So now if there is a, let's say a lump, that has formed inside the eye, right? If if the patient has some issue uh, in the eye, then what we will get is essentially there is one more interface that is coming into picture here, right? So we will get one more pulse, right? And this will tell us that there is some abnormality in the eye, right? Any questions up to this point? So this is what uh, we call as uh, uh, you know, a scan. So this is how an a scan is done. We'll talk about the other scan modes. Any questions up to this point? Okay. So now let's look at um, you know the other type of scan. So again, the same. Um, 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 so so one thing. Uh, one thing. Can you um, figure out that from here, from this kind of a scan, we are able to do what information do we derive here? We are not able to do a complete profiling. So if we are talking of this kind of a fat structure, right? We are not able to, in, in a scan, we are not able to do a complete profiling of this cross section, right? We are able to do, you know, if, if you are having the transmitter here, we just, we can just understand, okay, what are the interfaces that are there at this point? And what is the thickness only at this point, right? But if we want to study that, okay, how the fat layer is going to look like, or it's looking like inside, then an A scan is not sufficient, right? An A scan can be good to understand if there is a problem in the eye, because here we may not, um, like, we just want to detect the presence of this, um, you know, um, hardened tissue or whatever tumor here in the eye, because of which we are seeing that, okay, there is an additional pulse that is coming, right? But then if we want to kind of understand what is the, you know, what is the thickness or what is the size of this tumor, a scan will not be sufficient, right? That is understood, right? So can we do something more to get a complete profile of the body? So what we do here, so this we do a, a slight change in the arrangement. So what we do here is now, if we move this transmitter and receiver, along the body, along the surface of the skin, if we move that, right? And then if we, whatever A scan we saw, if we, it's like this. So Y axis, 
So whatever we saw in the uh, in the scan uh, in a scan, let's ex I mean let's kind of proceed further and see what we can do to get the profile here. So on the y axis now, I am. So for example, let's say my probe position is here. So this is let's say at x equal to zero. Let's say this is at x equal to zero, and I transmit a sound wave when the probe location is itself at x equal to zero and I measure. I measure. The reflected the time of the reflected pulses from each interface. So the first pulse. I'm getting because of the interface. Between the epidermis and the dermis, right? The second pulse I'm getting because of this guy here and the third pulse is because of the bone, right? So this is one measurement I take. Now, instead of one measurement, right? If I move the transmitter and receiver along the skin and I keep measuring, I keep plotting. For each X coordinate, if I keep plotting the points, right? Then you can see that I'm getting a profile of the complete body. Is this clear? So the only additional stuff that I have done is I have moved the ultrasound eco pulse system, right? The, the transducer I have moved along the body to get such a profile. Please note one more thing here in this diagram that I have shown. So the color or actually the brightness in this case, actually you can say that this is possibly the most faintest kind of a dot that I see here. And whereas here, this, this, these dots are dark, right? So what I have done is based on the intensity of the reflected wave, meaning based on the amplitude of the reflected wave, the pixels that I have corresponding to the brightness or the contrast or whatever you call it is dependent or proportional to the amplitude that I am receiving, right? So based on that, I can also figure out what kind of an interface it is, right? Meaning if this is faint, I know that OK, this this surface is something very similar to skin. And whereas if this is very dark here or in this, actually this you can if you take just the opposite of it instead of dark, I showed it in dark because of the background, but it can be white. Uh, the whiter it is, right? Or the brighter the pixel is. It can tell us that you know there is a hard object or the reflected coefficient or the reflection coefficient of the surface is actually higher than any of these, right? So based on this, I can do a profiling of the complete uh, body. Any questions up to this point? So this is what is called as B scan. Now, what is the problem you think with B scan? If we have to move the ultrasound like this, right? Is that a problem? Of course, there is a problem, right? Because to, I mean, then the amount of friction the patient's body is going to undergo, right? It is going to be very painful, right? We have to keep moving this transmitter along, um, you know, the body to do a complete profile here, right? Which um, is not such a good thing to happen. So. What typically is done is uh, so this is again a very modern um, kind of stuff. Um, so, so so we use something called a phase array. I mean, an array of transducers are used to mimic the movement of the transducer along the body. So what you can see here. So let's say here we have four such transducers, right? And if we are applying a pulse, a voltage pulse to each of the transducers. At the same phase, meaning at the same time, meaning the let's say the sine, sine waves that we apply to the piezoelectric crystal has the same phase for all the four transducers. Then we will see that the total effective. Sound wave being generated by this array of transducers has a direction which will be. Normal to the transducer surface, right? Because all the transducers we are giving a pulse and we can see that the effective propagation of the pulse. Will be in this direction. However, if we change the phase, we do not excite 
if we do not excite all these four piezoelectric crystals at the same time, but we excite them with a phase difference, right? Like this. So for example, here you can see the phase is zero here, and this is 0.4 pi, this is 0.7 pi, and this is pi, right? Whatever, this kind of shows that there is a phase difference between the pulses that we are applying. The effective sound wave that is being I mean that is being created by such a uh, stimulus is actually in this direction, right? And similarly, if we reverse the pulse, the phase of the pulses in, in, in this direction, then the effective sound wave propagation is in this direction. So essentially, what we have done is without moving the transducer from this place, we are now able to generate pulses or the sound waves in all directions. So without moving this guy along the surface of the skin, I know in which direction I'm, gen I'm sending this pulse. And when I'm, when I'm doing the image processing of it, when I get the reflected pulse back, based on the direction of the wave that I have sent, I can, so the X location of the probe is nothing but a function of the phase that I have given between the uh, you know, different transducer arrays. Is this clear? So this helps in reducing the movement of the transducer itself on the patient's body, right? Okay, so this is for B scan. So this is for B scan and I'm not discussing C scan for imaging. C scan is essentially nothing but so while the B scan is doing the cross section of the body, C scan takes the top view. So, so for example, let's say this is the skin of the body and here somewhere inside the body at the center. So this is the top view of the skin. And in the center, let's say there is some, you know, a foreign object that has come. So because of that, I mean, we would like to detect where the foreign object is sitting with respect to the top view, right? So there, if we kind of um, do a C scan, then we know that, okay, this is a foreign object. So I'm not discussing that. So essentially this is similar principles, but just that it takes the top view instead of the cross-sectional view, okay? So that is called for um, the C scan in the XY plane. So the B scan is for XZ plane here, and C scan is for in this flat plane. We take the scan from, from the top. OK. So now let's look into some uh, some of the very modern uh, electronics that goes into it. And this is going to be mostly descriptive because, you know, it is uh, impossible to um, go into the actual um, electronics. Uh, the course is too short for that. But let's try to understand what are the choices um, uh, that are there. And I, as I keep saying, right, and as uh, as engineering problems, right, it's it's only about making the right right choices, meaning there will be always options available, but what we need to choose to come up with the right solution. So that we need to understand, right? So the resonant uh, frequency of air coupled transducer ranges from 30 to 480 kilohertz. And this is again understandable because we don't want to emit sound waves in the audible range because that is going to create a lot of noise in our environment. And we do not want to do that. So the choice of uh, you know uh, the frequency for air coupled uh, transducers range from 30 to 480 kilohertz, right? And the frequency selection, please note this: frequency selection is done based on multiple you know um, uh, multiple parameters, and the, the 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 result of choosing the frequency also has multiple implications. So the frequency selection should be based on the resolution and the long range requirement, meaning how far we are going to detect the object from, right? So what is the distance that we are interested in? So as we see, if the in frequency increases, the resolution of the uh, transducer, meaning uh, the ability to detect smaller and smaller objects, that also increases, and that kind of makes sense, right? Higher the frequency, the resolution will be more. The higher will be the 
the directivity, the narrower directivity, meaning it, you can direct the high frequency uh, pulse in a very precise way. But the issue is the attenuation will be more and smaller will be the distance. You don't get everything right with increasing frequency. The resolution is better. The directivity is better, meaning you can focus the higher frequency pulse in a direction, but it will have more attenuation and it will have it will be able to cover a shorter distance, right? So. Um, for, so let's look at, you know, this is a summary for low frequency and high frequency um, advantages and disadvantages. So long range performance um, for low frequency between 30 to 80 kilohertz. And uh, these are easily available, right? It is essentially you can say uh, lower cost and easily available. Uh, at higher frequency, uh, you know, the resolution, um, it allows us to detect smaller and smaller objects. Uh, short blind zone, and we're going to talk about monostatic topology, what it means in the next slide. And the transmission is concentrated into a forward facing direction. So this is what we meant by narrower directivity, right? That we can focus the uh, wave in a certain direction uh, with preciseness. Uh, disadvantages, long blind zone, we are going to talk about long blind zone, low resolution, and it can be um, because it's very close to its low frequency wave, right? 30 to 80 kilohertz. It, it can be impacted by, you know, uh, environment which can have higher frequency components, right? So ultrasonic aggressors likely to be in the same frequency. And these are the disadvantages of the high frequency, this thing that short maximum detectable range. So if you look at this graph that we have here, how the sound waves are attenuated as a function of the distance, higher the frequency, we can see the attenuation of the wave is higher and higher, right? And so this is the resolution, um, the relationship of the resolution uh, and the frequency. Uh, the resolution is inversely proportional to the frequency, the speed of sound wave, whatever it is, it is. Um, and uh, yeah, so limited. So the other issue with this is, uh, you know, the high frequency ultrasonics may not be readily available. Right. OK, so let's look at the, the transducer topologies, meaning in what configuration these transducers can be used. So the transducer can be used in two different topologies, monostatic and bistatic. So what it means is um, monostatic means essentially we are using the same crystal or the same transducer element to actually transmit as well as receive or listen to the returning equals the same. So this this you can see the same transducer is being used to transmit and then receive. Whereas bi-static is this where you have a separate transducer to transmit and a separate transducer to receive. The um, uh, pulse, right? So um, the benefits of a, a single um, you know, monostatic configuration that we don't have to consider the angle or the reflected waves, right? They will go in a, a straight line and it will be reflected back. So we don't have to consider, I mean, there is no angle, uh, angular difference between the receiver and the transmitter, unlike what you see in a bi-static configuration, right? Because you can see this sound wave can have one particular angle to the object, and whereas the receiver, maybe somewhere here and this angle will be some different meaning. Uh, so it has to take into account. The angle uh, created because of the different locations of the receiver and the transmitter, right? And uh, so this is where the complexity comes. The time of flight round trip calculation must factor in the angle. And of course, this is high cost and a larger solution size because two transmitter, it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, there is. One more um, thing that we'll talk about this a little bit uh, later about the blind zone, uh, what we mean by a blind zone, we'll talk in a subsequent slide. But this is essentially the two configuration, a monostatic and a biostatic, and we'll take it. Uh, uh, I mean, this is the key takeaway from this. And the topology uh, that should be selected is based on the short range requirement. So whether do we need to really detect something? So for example, um, in recent, uh, in the recent uh, past, right? We had a 
helicopter, right, uh, which crashed uh, with our military um, top official, right, in in somewhere close to uh, in somewhere in Karnataka, um, you know. So there, right, uh, one of the fallacies is, you know, um, probably the radar system couldn't um, detect an object which is, uh, let's say, close to the helicopter, right? So distance, um, I mean, detectability of objects at uh, closer uh, uh, ranges, right, becomes an important criteria. And why it becomes an important criteria? Because, you know, uh, we don't want to, uh, I mean, of course, if we are detecting objects which are far off, we have time to adjust. But we have objects which are very close, right? And we are not able to detect precisely. That can create, um, you know, accidents, right? So depending on how, uh, I mean, how much detectability you want at shorter distance, the complexity of the design becomes more and more. Why? Because, you know, if you remember, I mean, in the two slides back, we discussed what is the relation between, so we discussed this, right? What is the relation, um, yeah. what is the relation between the reflected pulse? So we discussed these, um, um, these, uh, these relations, right? So all these constraints make it more and more challenging to design the system which can detect objects at shorter and shorter distance, right? So based on this requirement, you will either go for monostatic or bistatic. And uh, where this blind zone comes into picture, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in details. And then there are there is this thing of driver choice. What sort of a transducer, meaning what kind of a transducer you are going to choose? So there are two types available. One is closed top and the other is open top. So if you see here, these transducers are lying in a capsule which is sealed and it is not uh, open to the environment. Whereas here, there is a transducer which is open to the environment, right? So what are the uh, advantages and disadvantages of this? A closed top, the piezoelectric uh, membrane, uh, it protects in a closed top, it, it protects uh, the transducer from, you know, environmental conditions like heat, humidity. And it is also, I mean, there are ESD strikes. ESD will not get into ESD. Uh, it's electrostatic discharge that can come uh, because of, uh, you know, multiple phenomena from either from someone touching the device or, so we're not going to talk about ESD. This is something very critical to understand, but not in this course. And then suitable for uh, outdoor or harsh environments, right? Open top is it directly couples to air for increased receiver sensitivity, small driving voltage because there is it is not encapsulated in a in a package. The sound waves, I mean, if we give a small enough voltage um, to the transducer, it can create vibration and the sound waves can be propagated, right? However. In this case, because it is encapsulated in a package, we need much more, much higher voltages to drive a transducer sitting inside this package or in a closed top kind of a, uh, or, the, or the closed top type of environment, right? And so here uh, you can see the overall sensitivity. You can, these are quick, you know, um, things that you can take, but the key thing to understand is this needs a higher voltage drive and this can operate at a lower voltage drive and predominantly just because of this packaging that we have here, right? And because it needs a higher voltage drive, we probably will need a transformer, meaning the voltage that uh, we are going to generate from our electronic system that needs to be stepped up to give a higher voltage to the, uh, to the transducer. And this can be uh, driven directly. So obviously we can figure out that this will be a lower cost solution and a closed top one will be, of course, a higher cost solution. But then the closed top one, why do we go for a like high cost solution? Because if the environment is harsh and we still need to, if we are, let's say, doing some analysis in, let's say, sea or uh, some chemical, I mean, in an environment full of chemicals, right? Then uh, we would go for a closed top kind of a transducer, okay? 
So this is uh, the transducer, uh, the driver choice based on whether it is going to be a closed top or an open top. As we said that um, a closed top will need a transformer driver and an open top um, uh, is sufficient. We can drive it with a direct driver. And why uh, we need a transformer? Because a closed top, because it's 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 inside a package. We need the for the sound waves to propagate uh, outside the package. We need a higher drive, and that is the reason we need a transformer, right? So superior short and longer range performance due to large excitation voltage and matching component compatibility. So this also uh, this is understandable. And what is meant by matching component com 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 uh, compatibility? We'll talk about that in uh, in one foil later. So longer um, a, lo a longer ring decay time hinders minimum range capability. So this is where uh, I promised that you know in the last slide we are going to talk about that blind zone. Uh, so hold on for one more slide and we are going to you are going to understand what is ring time decay. The PCB size. So this is of course larger size because there, we need to have a transformer in the PCB, and this is smaller. So of course this is lower cost. And this is, um, you know, uh, and it, this guy can support uh, up to 500 kilohertz. So this can go all the way up to, um, you know, 500 kilohertz. Whereas this guy, because it is open top, it can support even higher frequency because, um, you know, it doesn't need that. I mean, you can possibly um, the lower voltage drive that is needed that allows us to give a higher frequency of pulses at, at, at one megahertz, right? So please note one thing here. So this is percentage of sound, sound pressure level. So basically what we are showing is the piezoelectric crystal, the voltage that we are going to drive the crystal with. Higher, if we keep increasing the voltage, the sound pressure that is emitted is going to become higher and higher. And beyond the point, of course, it will saturate. So please note this why a higher voltage is needed because higher we drive the piezoelectric crystal the sound waves can travel farther and farther out because the sound pressure level is increasing so it is imp so when you are designing the electronics which we will discuss in the few slides uh, later that um, how the electronics is going to be de designed but please understand that the drive strength of the voltage is very important to generate the sound waves from the transducer, right? Uh, this picture we will talk. This also we will talk in the subsequent foil. OK, so let's see. OK, so this is again the transformer and the direct drive configuration. So this is actually a real uh, chip. I think this is a TI chip uh, sitting here. So here what you can see um, is we have this transducer. I mean the transformer here and here in this case there is no transformer. And this sound, uh, so this guy is our transducer, the speaker. This is where the piezoelectric crystal is sitting, right? And um, the thing that you see here, it is a center tap transformer because why do we need a center tap transformer here? What we are allowing is essentially if, let's say, if this is center tap, right? Uh, so let's say this is the power supply. So this out A, this I can drag down to ground while this is. Uh, why, why, oops, sorry. Yeah, so this I can drag down to ground by, while this is uh, at the full power supply. And at other times, this, while this is at power supply, this I can drag down to ground. So the peak to peak voltage seen by the transducer can be doubled. It can be single ended also. Uh, so this is a center tap configuration which is used to increase the drive strength of the. Uh, transducer further even more here of course you can see this is a straightforward no transformer nothing uh, just based on the power supply you can um, so this is INN and this is INP so based on um, uh, you know uh, the pulse you will generate a pulse here between out A and out B this you can think how it is going to work like but I'm not going to again go too much in depth here no need actually so this is uh, again pre driver uh, for a push pull kind of a system. So as I said, so this is what I discussed in the pre last slide that with the use of this FET, this NMOS FET, I can pull down this terminal to be, uh, I can pull down this terminal to zero. 
or I can pull down this terminal to zero. And this is the crystal that I have. And this is a push pull configuration, meaning I can push or pull. So basically, you know, uh, the pulse that this guy will be seeing will be because at one point this is at ground and the other point this node is at ground, right? Here, this is a single ended configuration. This is not push pull. Here, what I do is so which which will have a higher drive strength? This guy will have a higher drive strength, right? Because this is a push pull configuration, and of course we have higher drive strength with the assumption that everything remains same. The power supply and the transformer and everything remains same, right? So we should not. Uh, we can of course, uh, you know, if these guys differ, then I mean, if these transformers are different, then of course the story will be different. But then um, the pre. Uh, so this is a pre driver for a single ended structure. So again, uh, the reason I'm showing this to you guys is uh, it's important that you know if you, as I say, right, if you were to choose uh, this domain as your career, right, you'll be ending up designing such kind of systems, and of course with the understanding of the overall uh, physics behind it. And um, so this is uh, the overall trans transformer driver, um, um, the large, you know, if you go, what is there inside the chip? What is there inside the chip? The key thing here I would like to highlight is a current limit control. So what happens is when you are turning this transformer on or off, right? It is important we don't end up burning uh, these FETs, right? So we need to ensure that these FETs are protected. So we need to have a current um, uh, that will be limited. So we'll, uh, so this will actually, uh, I mean, we will sense the current. So this is again a very key piece of electronic design. So again, if if you take higher courses uh, in electronic design, probably we can discuss how a current limit control can be designed uh, with what parameters. Um, so this is of course uh, the capacitor and electrolytic charge capacitor. This is the transducer, center tap voltage, and this you can see these are large power fets that are either it can be inbuilt. Or in this case here, you can see it is external to the chip, right? So, uh, so this um, this BJDs are external to the chip because it has higher current carrying capability. You may not the technology may not allow us to integrate all the devices inside the chip, right? That the uh, the amount of current that will be flowing in these devices may be limited by the technology, and because of that, if such is the scenario, then we might have to end up using an external BJD. So this, of course, uh, so this configuration, of course, so both are, you can see, uh, so these configuration will be used where for closed top configurations, right? Closed top uh, transducers, right? Because the voltage that we, are, we need to generate will be much higher. But then even in the closed top, we can see the driver configurations can be different. Here, this is fully integrated, whereas here we have external transistors. And this is what we call as the half bridge. So if you see how the bridge is going to work. So here, so for example, here this is center tap. So this is center tap, and we are pulling this node down or this node down, not at the same time. It is like you know complementary to each other. Here, each of these, so this is like a inverter. So when this guy will be on, this guy will be off, right? So you, so when this guy is zero, this guy will be you know pulled up to the power supply here. And then of course uh, there are things like you know we have to detect the driver voltage. So this this ensures we need to have a lot of protection mechanism in the chip to detect what is the power supply. And if the power supply actually um, because of a fault event or uh, it increases significantly, um, uh, we don't want to burn the driver. So then in that case, we will have to disconnect the power supply. And um, so, uh, so, so this is the pre driver voltage. So this voltage is also regulated. It, it is not that, you know, we apply any voltage that we want. So we want some sort of regulation here. And the lab assignment that has been given to you is, of course, a linear voltage regulator. So it's a similar concept that, you know, um, so the last week, whatever lab assignment we gave, right? That kind of uh, will do this job. This is actually a, uh, how to say, a kind of a control which shows not the details, but a linear voltage regulator can, you know, uh, uh, do a similar job, which is shown by this mid trigger here, right? Okay, so I think we'll stop here. Uh, we are almost done. We have another class today at um, 2 p.m. 
and we'll finish the ultrasound uh, system today and then we'll be ready for mid semester uh, exam uh, next uh, week so i'll make some uh, i'll give you some directions for next week uh, uh, exam uh, when we talk again today at 2 pm and the lab of course will be there from 3 pm right so we'll stop today uh, i mean stop today means stop for now and then we'll uh, continue uh, with the next uh, in the next class from 2 to 3 okay thank you guys